Well, we've been in the series Everyday Faith, reading through the book of James. It's a really small book, only five chapters, 108 verses, but it's jam-packed with very practical instruction about how to have an everyday faith because we want to grow in everyday faith because faith will be needed every day. Every day has challenges that are going to test us. They're going to challenge us. They're going to show up in our lives unannounced, uninvited, but never without purpose. And James tells us how we can grow in everyday faith because our faith should show up every day on a Monday. In your everyday moments, it should show up. And James is writing to these followers of Jesus who were scattered and facing very difficult times. And this week, I want to talk about your faith, how it affects you. And next week, we're going to talk about how our faith works together to have an everyday faith in this thing we call the church. Uh, but today, let's, let's talk about your faith. But let's think about your situation. I want you to think about a couple questions. Where in your life right now is something very, very challenging? See if you can bring something to mind. For some of you, that's pretty easy. You knew it right away. What's very, very challenging right now? Where are you in a season of waiting? Where is it that you're waiting for something and it's difficult and maybe uncertain? Where are you waiting? And then in that difficulty and in that uncertainty and in the season of waiting, is there an area of your life where you're losing heart? Like, it's just hard to maybe get up. It's hard to take the next step. It's, it's when something goes wrong, you hang your head like, here we go again. Like, where is it that you're losing heart? And it can affect a lot of different areas for us. Usually one of the big common areas for many of us, it's, it's relationships. There's a relationship there and it's not going well. Or, or there's not a relationship there and we want there to be one. Or there, there, there's a relationship that was there and now there's a, a split, there's a conflict. Like it's just not what it was. Maybe it's a, a, a parenting relationship where kids have, have wandered or kids are challenging. Maybe, for, maybe it's a parent's deal where the parents have wandered or the parents are challenging. Maybe it's something at school or something at work and there's just a relational challenge there that you feel like you're in this difficult season and you're waiting for something to change in your relational world and it's not changing. The other big one is our financial world. Maybe you're in a season of waiting to kind of finally dig out of this pit of debt that you're in. Maybe there's some new challenges that you didn't expect, you didn't even invite, but they showed up and financially you're not sure how you're gonna make it. Maybe it's looking for a new job or trying to figure out how to handle something that you just didn't expect. Emotionally, we find ourselves in those seasons that are really challenging and difficult where we're waiting and maybe it's a season of loneliness or a season of pain. Maybe it's in your physical world. You went to the doctor and you thought everything was gonna be fine and they said it's not fine. And it was shocking. Maybe it's not your physical world. Maybe it's somebody else's physical world that there's someone in your life that's navigating something physically and it's effect, impacting them and you feel that for them and you wanna do something, but what can you do? There's all these different areas in our life. Maybe even you're wanting to have a family, but it's a season of God just hasn't moved that forward yet. It's a season of infertility. Maybe it's a season of a lot of conflict with someone and you're ready for just peace. Maybe it's an overall situation with the world where you're ready for the world to kind of move on and kind of, can we get over this and just kind of get along? Like, I don't know what it is for you, but we find ourselves in seasons that are challenging and we find ourselves waiting. And James is themed uh, to, uh, of his letter to people who are in a situation that wasn't all that different than ours, dealing with all of those challenges and then some, was keep going. Like, keep going, keep taking that next step. Don't get stuck. Keep going and keep growing. Following faithfully means living out your faith every day. And he uses a word at the beginning of his letter called, and he uses the word perseverance, the ability to keep going when you don't want to keep going. And then he uses another word that a lot of us, it's not our favorite word. He says, this is how you persevere. And he uses the word patience. 
like, what do they say? Patience is a virtue. And like, I would finish that. Patience is a virtue that none of us want. <laughs> like, I don't want to have a reason to have patience. And being patient is never fun. Like, you hear the word patience and you're like, oh. But here's what James says. This is how he tells us to handle those seasons. Be patient. I don't want to be patient. But this is what's going to be required of us. So how do we grow patience? How do we develop? And what does it actually look like? And he says, be patient then, brothers and sisters. Well, what does the then mean? Everything he just said. And the thing he just talked about right before this is there was a huge issue in these gatherings of believers where people who had money were looking down on people who didn't have money. If you had money, you were given special privilege. If you didn't have money, you were kind of written off. And there were all these kind of socioeconomic challenges going on. But really, if you think about everything he's written up to this point, keep going, keep growing. You know, care for one another. Don't speak bad against each other. Uh, all these things. And he says, whatever you face, whether it be how you keep going, how you handle temptation, how you handle wisdom, when, what do you do when you don't know what to do? How do you handle conflict with others and, and valuing others? Like all these things are things that require us to be patient in the process. And he says, be patient then until the Lord's coming. You know what we do? I'll be patient until my problem is solved. And he doesn't say that. This is incredibly important for you. And it's, it, you know, I'll be honest. It may be discouraging for you. Our focus is I want to be patient till my story is figured out whether it be a relational deal, a financial deal, a physical deal, whatever it is. And James says, your story is too small a thing to live for. You were created to live for something more. And Jesus tells us, like, die to self. For, you know, lay down your plans. And we think we're losing something. We've said that several times in this series. But James says, no, this is the deal. The Lord's coming. This is what we should look forward to. And a lot of us hear that and go, well, that's just when time's up. No, actually, that's when the kingdom begins in its fullness. Like there's no more sin and brokenness in the world. All the things that are causing all those things that we're having to patiently wait through, Jesus says, I'm going to resolve it when I return. And in the meantime, I'm trying to reach as many as possible to invite them into my family and my kingdom. So on that day, I want to include as many as possible. Who wants in? And basically what he says is your story matters. What you're going through matters. Cast your cares upon him. You matter. Your problems matter. But that's not the point of the story. You're invited into the story of your creator to live as a child of God in the kingdom of God, on the mission of God. And the problem is I care more about what I'm going through today than what he's promised to do someday. And even what he's doing today, there's something challenging that James is inviting us to think bigger than our lives. Folk, be patient, not until your problem is over, but until Jesus says, well done. You've run a good race. And he gives us three examples of what being patient looks like. And the first one is a farmer. I grew up in a little town outside of Fort Worth called Dallas. And we didn't have, I didn't have a lot of exposure to farms. So, I, you know, they didn't, I don't, as far as I know, my high school didn't have Future Farmers of America or 4-H. That's a thing, right? 4-H? Am I getting that right? Okay. Uh, like, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't have that. Like, I've not been, I'm city folk. So, so farming, like, I, he says farmer to me, and I'm not sure if I get it. It may click with you. It clicked with them. Like, they get it. But most of us. I mean, I, I've known a few farmers in my life, like old McDonald, I knew him, and, and uh, th that's about it. So, so he, he gives the example of a farmer. So think about a farmer of what it likes to be patient until Jesus comes back, okay? This is what he says. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. Patiently waiting. Now, most of us, when we go, hey, what is your biggest hope for the next week, the next year, the next season of life? I hope I get to have a season of patiently waiting. None of us look forward to that. But this is a necessary season. If God's gonna grow what he wants to grow in your life, in the world, and in for eternity, it requires patiently waiting. 
They went, they're patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains, the things that drive the growth. You too, like a farmer, be patient and stand firm. He says it again, because the Lord's coming is near. Isn't it interesting? These are people that are suffering. And he doesn't say, until your suffering is over. The reality is, and most of us have lived enough life to experience that, my biggest problem today, once it's gone, there's somebody else on deck warming up, ready to step in and be another challenge. That's what this world is gonna be. It is a broken and fallen world that Jesus wants to step in and redeem for something bigger that will last forever. And the challenge for us is we devalue eternity in light of what we're going through. And that's what pain does. It turns us inward. It needs to be paid attention to, but it can do some very selfish things for our lives. So he gives the example of farming. So if you're in a season of patiently waiting, which at some point we all will be, we all need to be, let me ask you some questions to think like a farmer. Because again, I'm not a farmer. I've never been one. I don't foresee that in my future. If that's the case, we will not be well fed. <laughs> but if, if farming is required, I'll do it. So let me try and think like a farmer for a minute. Let's think about farming and what it looks like for you to patiently wait in this season of life. Here are the questions. What are you hoping to see grow? If a farmer is going to grow something, they're not surprised at harvest. They don't go out and go, oh, look, it's cotton. I had no idea. It's not like a Christmas present that's been wrapped. They knew what was going to grow or what they hoped would grow. And everything was driven toward that goal. So let me ask you this. What are you hoping to see grow in your life? And is it the same thing that God wants to see grow in your life? You should really care about that for a couple of reasons. One, if, if it's the same thing that God wants to see grow, you've got the best possible resource on your side to grow it. But the other thing is it helps you understand if you're aligned with what God wants to do in your life. If you're really following him or you're asking him, hey, Jesus, would you follow me? Here's my plans, here's my problems. Would you just work it all out? He cares about those things, but he's calling you to something bigger. So what are you hoping to see grow in your life? If you are patiently waiting and all of a sudden things resolved in the next three weeks, three months, three years, after a season of patiently waiting, what are you hoping to see grow in your life? And if you ask God that question, God, what are you hoping to see grow in my life? Because once you have clarity on that, then you have to ask this question. As, as a farmer, what am I planting? Again, if you're hoping to grow pumpkins, you plant pumpkin seeds. A farmer's not surprised when things grow and it's harvest time. And if something other than that grows, he's got a problem. But planting in your life is something very, very important. What are you planting in your life, in your head, in your heart, in your relational world? What are you reading? What are you listening to? Who are you listening to? What is the primary influence on your life? Because we have so many things that are trying to plant seeds in our life that can grow into unhealthy, unfruitful things. So pay attention to what's being planted in your life. Be intentional about that. And you might actually... Seek out the things that God, if God wants to grow you in a certain area, seek out his truth and his promises in those areas. And then here's the thing a farmer has to figure out because they can only control so much. What is my role and what is God's role? There's part of a farmer can do to make it grow, but there's part of it, it's dependent on the weather. I can't make it rain, but I can't irrigate. I can get out the hose. It's just how much I know about farming. I mean, I, I, I threw out the word irrigation, irrigation to sound like I know something about farming. But like there's so much that we can only do. We plant the seeds. We pray for rain. But there's a lot of it that's God's. It's the same thing for what God's trying to grow in your life and do in and through your life. There's some things that you, you're responsible for. But there's a lot of it that God's responsible for. What is God's role in growing something in me and doing something through me. And what's my role? And he gives us a little clue to some of what our role is with one of his examples later, but, but that's the next question. Like figure out what is my role and what's God's role and figure out what your role is and live it out faithfully. And if it's my role, I need to work the soil. So that's the next question. What does it look like to work the soil? 
We'll come back to this question in a few weeks. We're going to do a, this summer. We're going to read through the parables of Jesus. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And Jesus told this story about wh what it means to work the soil. We'll talk about that then. But think about in your life, are you creating the conditions that are right for God's truth to take root in you and grow in you and produce fruit in you? Like, are you presenting yourself in a way where God can do that in you? What does it look like to work the soil? And then here's the next question. What does it look like to be patient in the process? If James says that we should be patiently waiting, what does that look like for you right now? Like, be specific. What does it look like for you to be patient? I struggle with anxiety. I know to be patiently waiting means I need to kind of set my anxiety aside, to cast my cares upon him because he cares for me. I can't let those lead me. Being patient in the process might be um, uh, a very specific thing of, that, that helps you. If you're gonna be patient in the prog process, one thing that helps you is to celebrate progress. If you've been waiting for a season of time and it's just not there yet, can you see any evidence of growth in your life? Being patient in the process can really be helped when you celebrate progress. You, and here's one thing that can, that, that can mean. Maybe you, you don't have an answer to a specific area. You're really wanting God to do something. An answer to a prayer. There's a challenge. There's a relationship. Whatever it is. Celebrating the progress might not be on the specific area you're praying about now. It might be celebrating the progress of how God showed up in the past. This is why it's really important. Gratitude serves a purpose in our life. It reminds us to say thank you for what God's done so we understand his character and his track record. So when I find myself in a challenging situation, I can think back, well, God's shown up before. I can count on him. He's been faithful to provide in the past. I can count on him. It reminds us. Sometimes celebrating the progress uh, that can help us in the process is actually look to see how God has grown you. This is why it's important, like journaling is a great thing. If you ever go back and read uh, excerpts from previous journals and you think, wow, I've grown a lot from that season to this season. And God did that. I can see the fruit of how he's growing me. So understanding what it looks like for you to be patient in the process sometimes can really be helped by celebrating the progress. And, and James says, be patient and stand firm. And sometimes when we hear that, we think that says, stand still. That's not what it's saying. Stand firm is what are you anchored in? What are you rooted in? But patience is not inactive. Patiently waiting is not passively waiting. For you in a season of waiting, and what's got, what does patiently waiting look like for you? It might require something of you. It might be if there's a broken relationship and you're praying that God will redeem that, he might say, hey, as you patiently wait for that relationship to be restored, you're not passively waiting. Pick up the phone. Go, go meet with them. Pray for them. Speak to them. Like, do something. It's not a passively waiting for God to, re, to fix it. Usually, when God's involved of doing something, he requires something of his kids. I want you by faith to take a step that's bigger than you can think you can take and it's more than you think that you have in you because then it reminds you if God doesn't do it, it's not gonna happen. But it usually requires something of you, a step of faith, of doing something. Patiently waiting is not passively waiting. And for many of us, when we don't know what the future holds and we have this fear of the unknown, we think, I just need to stand firm. Like we freeze and we don't take the steps that God wants us to take in this area or another area, and we just get frozen. But keeping going, it's, it, it's a challenge to keep going when you, you're not knowing. We get stuck sometimes when we don't know what God's gonna do or how it's gonna work out. And James would say, just don't give up. And patiently waiting means focusing more on God's purpose and timing than mine. That's a tough deal especially the deeper the pain I'm feeling because of the situation. And James would say, would you trust God with the process? And again, he says it because the Lord's coming is near. This was such a big deal to them and it should be a big deal to us. The danger of us when we're under stress and pushing through tri tri uh, trials is why we're patiently waiting. 
we act out a bit. And he, so he says this. He kind of pauses from this and he says, don't grumble against one another because if you're in a season of patiently waiting or impatiently waiting, either one, if you're in a season where you're having to wait, it's challenging, it's difficult, a lot of times what we do is we start grumbling. And not just to one another, we start grumbling against one another. We look for someone to take our frustration out on. So James says, don't do that. Like when you're frustrated, people still matter to God. How you talk to them still matters. And be careful that you're gonna have a tendency to grumble against one another. Don't do that. And he says, you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Again, the third time he said, Jesus is coming back and this is a big deal. Live this day with that day in mind. He says it's a big deal. Keep the end in mind. And in that process, don't grumble. Words matter. We talked about that several weeks ago. And that's our thoughts and our words because those are the first thing that bubble over when frustration, difficulty, impatience, all those things in our life, our words tend to bubble over, talking to people or about people. Then he gives another example. There's the farmer, and then he gives another uh, um, example, the prophets. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. The prophets, he's talking about these people that we read about in the Old Testament. I don't know if you've read them, but they had. They knew who they were talking about. They probably had the uh, prophet action figures as kids and prophet posters on their walls. Like these were the heroes of the faith because God asked them to do something that was really challenging for them. Sometimes it was to say something. I actually looked this up. I wondered because like these prophets, uh, Elijah, Jeremiah, Moses, Jonah, all these people that God said, hey, I want you to go tell the people that this is what I think about what they're doing. And you need to tell them it's wrong and they need to change their ways. And a lot of times the prophets were like, no, thank you. I'd rather, I'd rather get on a ship and go, go this way than go that way. Like, I don't want to do that. Some of them did it and it didn't always go that well. And so when they knew about the prophets, I wondered in my mind, does the phrase don't shoot the messenger, did, like, did that come from those guys? And they actually, actually uh, Shakespeare used it in one of his plays. Um, I'm not a farmer, I'm not a Shakespeare guy either. Uh, and then uh, Sophocles, was that a philosopher? Yeah, it sounds right. We'll say it was him. So there was somebody back there who was, was this uh, philosopher in ancient Greece, and, and they think he originated the phrase, but don't shoot the messenger. Like someone brings bad news and you're like, I don't like you. That's what they had to deal with. They showed up with a hard truth and they didn't get treated very well, but they kept going, not perfectly, because we know some of their story. Probably most of you, even if you've never been in church, you've heard of the story of Jonah and the whale, where he says, go to this really bad city and tell them they're doing something really, really bad. They need to change their ways or it's not gonna end well for them. And Jonah's like, good, I don't want it to end well for them. So he actually runs the other way and then God brings him back. He kind of goes and he kind of half-heartedly tells them to turn, change their ways, hoping that they don't. Then they do and then Jonah's actually mad that they, they, they repent. And he actually was wanting to see the destruction of the city. Like he did not do it perfectly, but he did it. And he took a step. Moses, he he was told to go do something. He's like, I'm not the guy. I can't do it. He doubted along the way. He made tons of mistakes, but God still used them. We're not gonna do this perfectly. But there is something about we have in common with the prophets that God asks of you as well. That they were faithful to do what God wanted them to do and say what God wanted them to say and it often cost them something. This is true for us too. God will often ask you to do something and say something that will cost you something. And that's where patiently waiting turns into standing still. Not standing firm rooted in the the path that God wants me to take, but standing still like I don't wanna move forward. I don't wanna do it. And we miss out on something. Early in James, he had talked about in James 1, 2, you can go back and read this, but he says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. We talked about that the first week. I don't consider it that way. But James said, you should. And he said, why? In verse three, because it's doing something. God's using that to do something in you. And then he says in verse 12, that if you persevere, if you keep going, you're blessed. That God will honor you. 
He will bless you. And then he says in verse 25, blessed is the one who actually does what God asks. Like this idea of being blessed is something that God says, and that word blessed, it can literally mean it's to your advantage. There's a heavenly advantage that God gives you. It's not karma. It's not good luck. It doesn't mean go buy a couple scratchers and see if you win the lottery. It doesn't mean you can have green lights all the way to work. There is some, there's a heavenly advantage that God says, it is unique for you when you do what I say. The safest place to be, be and to live a blessed life is in the center of God's will. It does not mean that'll be the safest place in your life. It'll often cost you something and it's challenging. And we lose sight of that there is something blessed both now and in eternity that matters. But he gives the examples of, of the prophets who were just simply asked, go say this, go do this. And their obedience was measured by their obedience. What did they do? They did all that God asked of them. And then he gives an example of somebody else from the Old Testament, Job. It says this, as you know, we count as blessed, again, there's that word, those who have persevered, there it is, keep going when you don't want to. You've heard of Job's perseverance. I don't know if you have, probably much like Jonah, I bet a lot of people have heard of Job. It's a guy, a character in the Old Testament. It's actually a book of poetry. There's a poetic story written about his life. And it's not a happy one. He has everything and he loses everything. And then his friends show up trying to say the right thing and they say the wrong thing. They start thinking, Job, something must be wrong with you if life's not going good. We think that too. If life's not going good, it's, it's probably something I did or maybe it's something you did or it's something God did. And, and suddenly we, we kind of get focused, but Job didn't do it perfectly, but he kept going. And he kept saying, no, I'm gonna trust God. Even if it's my last breath, I'll say that. And we've seen what the Lord finally brought about. That word finally is a turn of the page of the Bible, but it was years, patiently waiting, was not passively waiting for Job because he had to keep trusting when the circumstances in his life said, there's no reason to trust God. Look at your life. Why would you trust God? His friends even come and say, hey, something's wrong here. This one third guy, our fourth guy comes along and he goes, yeah, you should just cash it in. But he kept going. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. This is the lesson we draw from Job's life of what was finally brought about. But every page leading up to that would cause you to doubt that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. I bet Job was asking questions like, God, don't you care? We know that he was. You've probably asked questions like that. I have. Because when life gets bad, we forget that God is good because we look at our life, through, uh, our, our God's truth through the lens of our circumstances. Life is bad, so I'm gonna look at God. Boy, God's really bad. And God wants us to flip the script and say, no, we look at our circumstances through the, the lens of God's truth and his character of who he is. He's understanding. He cares. And the danger of it really is when we have difficulties, we reconstruct God to fit the narrative of what's going on around us. We recreate God in the image of what we see around us or we recreate God in the image of what we, how we feel. And we do that to make sense of them. I can't make a sense of what's going on in my world. Why would a good God allow that to come into my life? And so we rearrange our understanding of who God is based on what we see or what we feel. And instead, the ones who got this right, who were patiently waiting, who figured out what it looks like to have trust in the midst of difficulty, they let God reconstruct their life to fit the plan he had for the life and invite them to be part of his plan. Now, let me be real clear, like, like pay attention to your pain. Acknowledge it, it really does hurt. It really is difficult. Pay attention to your pain, but don't lose focus on God's plan. So, so James kind of sums it up this way. It's the verses from the earlier. Be patient. That's hard to do, but it's necessary. If you want to have an everyday faith, it will require you being patient. Patiently waiting. Patient and standing firm. And understanding that what happens today and, uh, matters in terms of how you respond to it. But live this day with that day in mind, with the one day where Jesus says, time's up and he returns and he comes back. Don't give up until that day. 
Paul said it this way in Galatians 6, 9. We actually have a memory verse every week at Live Oak. I don't know if you guys knew that. You can find it on the app or the website. This week it's this one. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. There's the farmer. If we do not give up. Many of us are weary. It has been a tough year. For many of you, it's been a tough several years, maybe even longer. This is many of us. We are weary. And I can't control how I feel, but I can manage how I respond to it. And I can choose not to let my weariness define me. And then he says this phrase that, ah, we don't like this one, at the proper time. It's his timing, not ours. And I don't like that. I want to speed things up. But God says, no, there's a purpose in the timing. If the farmer pulls out the seed, or the, the, what, he, what he planted, a week after he planted it, it's not going to be what it was created to be. It's not going to be fully developed. It won't serve its purpose. There is a timing involved, and trust the process means trust God's process and timing. But the key indicator, what's God's responsibility and what's ours? If we do not give up. What does it look like for you to be patient? Patiently waiting. Not passive, but patiently waiting engaged in what God's doing in your life and in the world and in the world around you. What does that look like? If we do not give up. That's our part. The other part that's ours is this, doing good. What is the good God wants me to do? Let me tell you why that question is so important for you on two different levels. One, we talked about it last week. You were created on purpose with purpose. There is good that God wants to do in you and through you in this world. There is good he wants to do, not to, because he love, to get his love, but because you're loved, because you were created by him, redeemed by him. He says, in Christ, there are good works. He's planned for you to do. There's some good that you can do that no one else can do it like you or as you could because of your background, your past, your strengths, even your weaknesses, like all of who you are. God says, I can use that uniquely in what I'm doing in the world. And there is good that you need to do. So there's one reason. You need to be asking the question, what is the good God wants me to do? Here's the other reason. If you're in a season of difficulty, asking that question is important. Because, and I can say this from my experience, when, when you have pain in your life, it turns you inward. And if you're created to do good and you're not doing good, something is damaged. Something is off. Something becomes weak. Like it just, there's something about our life that if there's not an outflowing of doing good that God wants to do through his strength, through his power, through what he's given us, if we're not doing that and it's just focused on us, we become very depleted. And there's something even about our mental health, our spiritual health, even our physical health, that doing good for others actually helps us heal in some of the pain of what we're dealing with. Pay attention to your pain. Don't ignore it. Like if all of a sudden you have a pain it's somewhere in your body, God did that to remind you, hey, that's a check engine light. You might want to see someone about that. Same thing with emotional pain. If you have emotional pain in your life, don't ignore it. Pay attention to it. As a matter of fact, your mind, if you don't pay attention to it, will think something's wrong with you and more bells will start going off. Like your, your mind needs you to acknowledge, hey, that's a threat, that hurts, that's a pain, that's missing. Like you've got to acknowledge it. It can't be the purpose of your life, but it is a part of your life. And it's a part of your life God cares about deeply. Pay attention to it, but actually don't let it keep you from doing good because that might be the thing that spiritually, emotionally, physically keeps you afloat enough to actually attend to your own pain. There's just something about God designed the world for it never to just be about us. So in the midst of your challenge right now, in the midst of a season of waiting for you, I would challenge you this way. Be patient in the process. Let God do his work. Ask God what's required of you to work the soil, to be part of it. But if it's not your part of the process, don't rush it. Let God's timing play out. But do what you know to do. Be patient in the progress, process and celebrate the progress. Celebrate what God's done in the past or how you've seen growth in your life. Celebrate that because it reminds you there's evidence that God's been around me. And James, or, or Paul would tell us, and do good. 
do good for others. And we do good because God is good. And some of the reason that people don't understand that God is good is they look at the world and they see all the problems. And God wanted God's people, his kids, to be the ones who are doing good in the world to say, yeah, that's wrong in the world, but look at God's kids. They're doing good. It, how we do good in this world reflects on our heavenly father to let them know that God is good. God is good is the thing we're likely to forget when life gets challenging or God seems slow. But be patient in the process. And when you live with that truth in mind and live as if it's true, it changes the way we see the world, we see God, we see ourselves, we see others. Let's pray together. And actually, as we pray, I wanna pray specifically for those who are in a really difficult season. Maybe you're in a season of waiting or just a season of hurting, and I wanna pray for you. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is everyone, would you kind of bow your head and close your eyes and online? Obviously, no one's, you don't need to do that because you can't see anybody else. But those who are in the room, like, like, don't look around. But like, if you're in a season of life right now that life is really, really, really hard because you're waiting or because it's challenging and you're waiting for something to change or whatever. Like if you're in that season of life now, would you just quickly just kind of slip up your hand so I could see it? So like, yeah, that's a lot of us. And you know, I, I would raise my hand too. I'll, I'll go ahead and confess that. Like it's, life is hard. It's challenging. God, for those of us who raised our hands or those of us who maybe needed to, but we don't have the strength to do it because we're just tired. We've been waiting for something to change. We've been looking for something to show up or something to leave someone to show up, someone to leave. God, God, for many of us, we're in a difficult season. Thank you that you're right in the middle of that. You told us in the book of Psalms that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. So I know that you're close to each and every one of these situations. But when the situation gets really, really dark, we can't always see you that well. Help us to, to remember your track record of your faithfulness. Help us to remember your character. Help us to be patient in the process, to figure out what, what, what does it look like for me to be patient in this season of waiting. And God, for whatever reason, you kept anchoring those hopes, not just in a resolve to our circumstances, but the ultimate resolution to the problem in this world of a broken world that needs you deeply, that the ultimate resolution is when you make things right and show up. And that's just some, not something we can just hope that's there after we die. It's a reality we should live with every day. God, I pray for strength for those who are weak and weary. I pray for provision for those who are in need. I pray for help for those who are feeling helpless. And God, I pray that you would teach us to patiently wait, not passively wait, to stand firm, not stand still, but to keep going and keep growing and do the good that you designed for us to do. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, next week we're gonna wrap up Everyday Faith and it's gonna be a family Sunday. So kindergarten through fifth grade will be in here uh, in person if you're on site at 9.30 and 11. If you're watching online, we do have kids at our, our church at home, uh, Sundays at home, what's it called? Next slide. Sunday at home, thank you, for pre-K through fifth grade. Uh, next week, we'll have a note-taking page for those kids who are here based on the message. And uh, to me, it's one of the messages that I wish I had understood this as a kid because it caused me to walk away from the church for a season. And I wish I had understood this about this is what it looks like for us to do life together and what a church really means. So I hope you'll be here for that. Thanks for being here and thanks for joining us online.